Just take on an attitude of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we come now to your word, which is truth and life to all who find it. Lord, we need your word in this hour that we live in more than ever before. We pray, blessed Holy Spirit, that you anoint this word to our hearts, that our eyes might be open to see and our ears to hear, most of all, our hearts to receive the sacred words from this blessed book. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, I'll be reading from the book of Psalms, chapter 8, just one verse, verse 4. <clears throat> what is man that you are mindful of him? May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. This word comes to us this morning from one of the great psalms from King David. What is man that you are mindful of him? I'd like us to consider that question for ourselves this morning. I believe that David pens this verse from a position of self-awareness and truth. If this statement were made by an angel... I think we would analyze the text somewhat differently, perhaps from a standpoint similar to the outer brother of the prodigal son, who said to his father, Thou many years do I serve thee, neither I transgress thee or thy commandment at any time, and yet thou never gavest me even so much as a kid to enjoy with my friends. And yet this younger son, who has wasted away your living through riotous ways with harlots, thou hast killed the fatted calves. Though a third of the angels fell from glory, the remainder, it would appear, have served God faithfully since the moment that they were created. I believe that we can set forward this assumption because no disobedience is permitted in the presence of Almighty God. And while the angels may have considered, even marveled at man's relationship with God and posed this very question, that is not the case here. Man, what is it that thou art mindful of him? If this statement was made by a beast of the field, or a fowl of the air, one could challenge that the question was presented because man was given dominion over all of these. If the lily of the field said this, one could suggest that it was tired of being plucked from the earth to decorate man's table. If the fish of the sea put this forth, one might conclude that he was tired of being pulled from the sea to serve man's appetite. The query, however, does not come from angels, does not come from the beast of the field, the fowl of the air, the lilies of the field, nor from the fish of the sea. Nor does it come from man concerning another man. Oh, how in our human nature we justify ourselves by pointing at maybe the person sitting in the pew next to us. Didn't the publicans do this with regard to the sinners? How many times in the scriptures do we read, why is Jesus having supper with these sinners? Put another way, shouldn't he be eating supper with us? The query is not about one man concerning his neighbor. It's about one man concerning himself. In other words, the essence of what David is saying in this verse is, What am I, God, that you are mindful of me? The statement is self-analytical. And if we are to be like David, a man who the Bible says was after God's own heart, we must be analytical of ourselves. Man's nature is in fact, to do quite the opposite is to defend himself, to defend his decisions, to defend his life, to defend his moral positions, to defend even his errors and his sinfulness. But the Bible teaches us if we are to save our life, 
we are to first lose it. And this process requires at first a long, honest look in the mirror of who we actually are in the eyes of God. Let us consider David's query as we consider ourselves. What am I, God, that you are mindful of me? David was the greatest king that ever served over Israel, save Christ. And at that time, perhaps Israel optimistically believed that it would enjoy long years of unity in the kingdom. But we know from reading from this text that it was only a couple generations from David that Israel was divided into two nations, was in a very short time again sold into slavery, its temple brought to ruins, and even in this the hour that we live in, and in many of your lifetimes, we saw that Israel has still not lived under the harmony that it did under the kingship of David. Oh, how in the present moment, when everything in our lives is going well, we can lack foresight to the future. In the years of plenty, we can feel good about ourselves and ourselves spiritually. But when the famine comes... And when our enemies begin to besiege us, it's in situations like that that man becomes self-aware that perhaps he was lulled into spiritual lethargy. Did we not just experience this in the last year? Many of you went to work and your boss came to your desk and said, pack your things and go home. And when you got home, you were told you had to stay in your home. And then you were told you had to wear a mask. If you went out into public, how things can quickly change in a matter of a moment. Jesus teaches us in the Gospels, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man returns. And in the days of Noah, men were eating and drinking, making merry among themselves, marrying and giving away in marriage. In other words, their lives were just going about swiftly as they were accustomed to. But then the heavens opened up and the waters below came forth from the ground and God shut the door to Noah's ark. And the men who had been lulled in the spiritual lethargy then realized that the hour was too late. I believe that this last year has woken some people up, have caused them to think about themselves spiritually before God. Such was the state of Israel during the kingship of David. Kingship has many privileges, such as having riches and a grand reputation that extended beyond Israel. David was the first among men, his riches and fame and his reputation being heralded even among other nations. And even thousands of years later, this very day, we're talking about the kingship of David. I don't know if any of you Pay attention to what's going on in Jerusalem. But even this very day, they're unearthing things from David's palace. His, the, his prayer room and his old palace in the old city. The kingship of David is still very much being discussed. How many people in the world, maybe even you in your heart of hearts, if you were given the kingship of David, would believe that your life was a success? And yet David, having all of this, still posed the question to God. What am I that you are mindful of me? If David believed that his kingship was something meritorious to garner God's attention, he would have said, what other than my kingship, O God, makes you mindful of me? And yet David asserts quite in the opposite. I have reached the height of my peers. I rule over all of them, and yet this is as nothing in the eyes of God. David was also a very skilled warrior. The Bible says that Saul defeated thousands, but David his ten thousands. And this shepherd boy came from the hills of Bethlehem and onto the stage of history with nothing but himself in a slingshot and a few stones. But David's greatest weapon was not his slingshot, nor himself, or his stones, but his faith in the unseen God of Israel. 
What no other Israelite had the faith to do, David did when he stepped into the valley and defeated the great warrior from Gath, Goliath, and David was victorious. David's ability to be a warrior in battle is perhaps the greatest that Israel had ever seen, save Samson. And yet David doesn't say, save my kinship and save my warrior strength. What is it, O oh God, that makes you mindful of me? You see, David didn't put any credence in his physical strength, just like he didn't put any credence in his kingship. David was also a skilled musician. He played the harp beautifully and he wrote songs that are as poetic as any of Shakespeare's writings. I wonder how much time it took David to write each and every one of these songs. As he was receiving these words from God the Holy Spirit and reviewed them and recorded them, I wonder how much they ministered to his spirit in his present circumstances. And thousands of years later, even the prince of preachers, Charles Spurgeon and Martin Luther, would consider words and lines of David's text and be ministered to greatly. How many would be content at the end of their days with being one of the greatest writers that ever lived? But David knew that this did not cause God to be mindful of him. David was also very handsome. The Bible says he was a handsome man with beautiful eyes. Rudy. How the worship, how the world worships beauty in the hour that we live in. I once heard a teacher say when I was a young man, if you're ugly, your life is over. And he was joking, but kind of not. Because he created the contrast between two people that are interviewing for the same job. And he said, well, if you're equally qualified but ugly as the good looking person, you're not going to get that job. There's some truth to what that teacher said. Truth because the world that we live in nowadays worships beauty. How they alter their physical appearance and how they spend time on makeup and nice clothes just to make them, their appearance be attractive to their fellow man. And yet David, even though he was the most handsome, concluded, what am I that you are mindful of me? David sets forth a great reality before us this morning. One that, if we consider in our own lives, will offer us great wisdom from the Word of God. David was a king, a great warrior, a poet, was handsome. He was all of these things, and yet there was something within David that knew none of these things were worthy of God's attention. But let us not, not lose the point that David poses by asking this question in the first place. And that is that there was something in David's heart, something in his mind, something in his soul that made him know that God was mindful of him. You see, he had felt the presence of God sometime in his life and was left to ponder, why did God give me the privilege of feeling His presence? When did He feel it? Was it, was, was it when He was on the hillside in Bethlehem, tending to His father's sheep? And Jesse brought all of his other sons before Samuel, so that Samuel could anoint the king, next king of Israel, but David was forgotten about. Was it when David... When a messenger was sent to David to call him to Samuel and the oil flowed against his head, is that when David felt the presence of God? Was it when he picked those smooth stones up from the brook? Did he feel the power of God in his slingshot who anointed the faith that David exercised by stepping down into the valley? Was it when he cut off the giant's head? Was it when he took the throne of Israel after wandering for 12 years for his very life to escape Saul. When did David feel the presence of God? Is it when he wrote down this beautiful psalm that you and I are reading this morning? Was it when he defeated the Philistines in battle? 
Oh, I believe it was all of these times, but many more. Was it when he heard the still small voice of God speaking into his heart? There are experiences in our life that make us aware that God is mindful of us. Have you ever considered them before? And he's not mindful of us because we're a king. Not mindful of us because we're rich or because we have fame or a reputation or because we're strong or because we're a good writer or poetic or intelligent or smart or dare I say handsome or comely. These are not the reasons why God is mindful of us. But have you experienced the presence of God in your life? That makes you realize that God is mindful of you. You know, I think sometimes as Christians, and maybe even as human beings, we forget about how sacred we are to God. Does not the Bible say that before we were born, God wrote down our days in His book? Before He knit us together in our mother's womb, He knew who our parents would be. He knew the town that we would grow up in. He knew the moment that we would breathe our first breath. And when we shed our first tears as we came forth from our mother's womb, the Bible says He bottled them up and He counted the hair of our head. And every time that we lose one, He makes perfect record that the quantity is one less than He recorded before. You see, dear friends, God is mindful of us and has been mindful of us. And He was mindful of the day that the Holy Spirit convicted us unto repentance and we received Him for the first time as our Lord and Savior, asking the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse us from all of our sins. If He's been mindful of us in all of these moments in our life, does it not make sense that He's mindful of us right now? That He's looking down from heaven to earth and He's surveying the world to find vessels and people that can be used for His glory. He's mindful of the condition of your heart right now. He's mindful of whether or not you want to be used by God. He's mindful of if you want to evangelize the gospel. He's mindful of you, whether or not you want Him to enlarge who you already are in Him. But He's mindful for other reasons too. You know, as human beings, we can tend to contradict what we say and what we do, but God's not like that. We can tell someone that we love them, but our actions don't convey love. We can tell somebody that we're thinking about them or that we care about them, but never call them or write them a card. Or when we see them, we can just go about our merry way without even waving or saying hello. But God does not contradict Himself. And if in God's word he says that for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, then that love is without repentance. And God has proved that love by the sending of his son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. And if God loved us in the moment when he son, his son died, and in the moment when Jesus Christ resurrected from the grave, does it not follow that he loves us right now? And if we're going through a difficult time or if our circumstances are pressing in, can we not rely on the strong word of God, but more the evidence that God loves us by the death of our Savior upon the cross? What is man, O Lord, that thou art mindful of him? David realizing with full knowledge that nothing within himself should garner the attention of God understands that it must be something outside of himself that has grabbed the mind of the Almighty Creator. Let me close this morning with one last thought. What is God that you are mindful of Him? We want God to pay attention to us, but how much attention do we pay to Him? I've enlisted just several things that the world considers to be things to take mind of. A king, a president, fame and fortune. Is there any king 
that's greater than the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The Bible says that all kingdoms will be placed under His feet and brought into subjection to the kingdom that has no end. Is there any riches greater than the one who created gold and silver and all these gems that we wear around our neck and wrists? God created all of these. Is there any warrior that has more power than Almighty God who's undefeated? Who in the last days will defeat sin and death and Satan who will be cast into a lake of fire and tormented for all eternity but the people of God will reign with Him forever. Is there any more skilled writer or poet? When I pick up this book and I read the words of God, my heart is just alighted with joy and praise that God would think enough of me to leave me a record of what He thinks about me, what He thinks about the world, what He thinks about life, what He thinks about hardship and persecution and great victory, what He thinks about the beginning of my days and the end of my days. Is there any more skilled writer or poet than He who prophesied not only His birth, but His death and His resurrection, not only His first coming, but His second, and has enlightened men for thousands of years to pen these words on paper so that you and I can be the benefactors. Is there anyone more handsome or beautiful? When I survey creation and I look at the beautiful mountains and the trees, when the sun warms my face in the moon in the evening time, which God has set in orbit with His beautiful fingers, is there anything more beautiful than the lilies of the field? The rose that we smell. All of these beautiful, handsome things that God created. All of these things that we believe should make people mindful of us. God is. And yet how seldom we think about Him. What is man that thou art mindful of Him? Let me pose the question another way. What is God? That we should be more mindful of Him. We're so distracted by all of these things that are nonsense. And yet we fail to give God our thoughts which He deserves. Oh, is there one here who has never realized in their life that God has been thinking of you and been longing for this moment when you would give your life to Him? He's been waiting for it. Waiting patiently with long-suffering. Watching us make many mistakes and mishaps. Turning our backs on Him many times. But now, now is the day that it's time to start to think about God. And to start to take Him seriously. For the glory of His name we pray. Amen. Oh dear Father, as we just allow this word to settle into our hearts and as the choir sings the invitation. We just approach you with thankful hearts. Lord, you were thinking about us before we even had a mind to understand you. You were thinking about us while we were yet born and shaped in iniquity, while our ways were sinful. You were thinking about us while we neglected you and went about our merry way. And you don't love us because we're rich or because we're famous or because we're strong or because we're smart or because we're beautiful. You love us simply because you love us. And you loved us so much that you sent us Jesus. Lord, what a beautiful gift that you gave us. And right now, we receive that gift with joy. Dear friend, if you've never received the gift of Jesus Christ, if you've never invited Him into your heart to be your Savior, don't let this moment pass you by. He's beautiful. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. He has all power in heaven and earth. And He has power right now to wash away your sins with His precious and His holy blood. Is the Holy Spirit right now pricking your heart? Is He reminding you of all the times 
that you've turned your back on God by what you've said, done, or failed to do. Ask His forgiveness. Ask Him to wash you clean in His precious blood. Lord, I've only been thinking of myself, but now I center my thoughts upon you who loved me, the unlovely one, who died for me while I was yet an ungrateful one. But now, right now with a heart of gratitude, I ask you to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. I accept your death upon the cross as being done in my place. Won't you sit on the throne of my heart and be my Lord and my God? You've given your life to me. Now, Lord, I give my life to you. And I ask you to do with me what you will. The Bible says he'll never leave you and he'll never forsake you, even always to the ends of the world. How good it is to belong to God. What is man that thou art mindful of him? David knew it was nothing within himself, but all of the good in his life that he received was to the glory of God. And that's our testimony too, Father. All of the goodness that we've experienced in our life, it all belongs to you. We give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. And let me close by saying this. I believe that every man and every woman, every person, if they're given the privilege of being cognizant in their last moments on this earth, won't value their reputation among men, nor their strength, nor their intellect, nor their beauty. But what they will value is how much time they spent thinking about Jesus. Let that knowledge of the latter days upon this earth benefit us in this present moment by proclaiming that all our thoughts belong to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All our thoughts belong to our Savior. And Lord, may you do with them what you will. In Jesus' name, we ask all these things and pray. Amen and amen.